G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. This time we're doing this month's version of AFL Underrated or Overrated. So the premise of this is you in my YouTube community tab gave me some topics to discuss in this video and I have to decide whether I think they're overrated, underrated, or in some cases I might say that they're adequately rated. Always enjoy doing these videos with you. It's nice to have that community vibe, have you guys contribute to the show. Going forward, if you wanna be included in these videos with your comments, make sure you subscribe for a start and also make sure you keep an eye out on posts. I do these videos once a month. I do unpopular opinions, I do would you rathers as well. It's all good fun. So let's crack into it. I think we had like 40 comments this week, which is good. I don't think I've got absolutely all of them in, but I've done my best. We've started off with one from Amando07 and AFL Snaps, which is kind of around the same topic. So this is around draws. Mando says the draw is overrated. I see older football fans complaining about the idea of extra time or a goal kicking shootout to decide a drawn game when I think it would significantly add to the excitement of close games. Playing or watching three hours of footy for no one to win is pretty underwhelming in my opinion. And AFL Snap says overtime, is that underrated or overrated? So my opinion is I actually quite like the idea of a draw in season. Now, obviously for finals, it's a little bit different. We've seen a handful of finals go to extra time. I'm, I'm thinking of two that West Coast were involved in, once against Port Adelaide, once against Collingwood. I actually am struggling to remember any other drawn finals that went to extra time, forgive me. But both of those were exciting, and we've seen one grand final replay. Obviously, 2010, they decided to change the rule, and I do kind of understand that. I think within finals, it is too logistically hard to organize replays. That being said, for, for the season, there is something beautiful and unique about draws in the season. There's that empty feeling. I mean, I suppose the, the, the way you feel about draws probably depends on whether or not you were expected to win that game. Were you five goals up? Were you the underdog in that game? Either way, I kind of like it as a quirky little aspect of our game where it only happens a few times a year and both teams walk away feeling a little bit empty. I mean, is the overtime thing coming? Perhaps, perhaps. It would be interesting the flow on effect to like, you know, broadcast. I'm sure they would like it. It would probably help their ratings. You know, if, if the game goes to overtime, you might message your mates and go, oh shit, this game's going to overtime. You should watch it. Like I could see how that would be good for ratings, but it would also push back into the, the next time slot naturally. So I think it could happen in the future, but I kind of like it the way it is. For finals, overtime makes sense. Uh, but for in season, I like the quirkiness of it. Riley Burke says, bring back the five minute warning on the scoreboard. Yeah, so I think this was, was this a channel 10 thing? I, I forget. Channel nine or channel 10 used to do the five minute warning. So for anyone uninitiated, um, the, the clock would change from count down to count up. So you wouldn't know when the siren was going. I'm not sure exactly when they finished this, but I do know that it was count up at least for the 2006 grand final. And I did like that to some extent, I did. And it's kind of just like being at the game because at the game, you generally have no idea how long is left unless you're messaging someone who's watching it on TV, which I was doing in the 2018 Grand Final. And also I think the AFL app now has a feature where you can see how long's left, although naturally it's gonna be a little bit delayed, I think. So I agree, underrated, bring it back. Remy Schauder, hope I'm saying that right, it says Sam Frost is having an awesome season and the narrative around him needs to change. Yeah, I mean, I probably don't have really strong views, but uh, there's no doubt he's having a decent season. I think a lot of the perception around Sam Frost was just that he turned the ball over a lot. He's kind of an interesting, unique player, very fast and very you know, aggressive sometimes. Uh, but this year, in a year where Hawthorne needed some reinforcements to stand up, obviously with the injuries they had in the in the preseason, James Blank doing his ACL for a start, and they probably went in this year with a little bit light on KPDs. I do agree that the hate's probably been overblown. One thing that I do notice is that his um his efficiency in turnovers has gone right down. So sometimes players just learn to play within themselves a little bit, and I think Sam Frost has done that quite effectively this year. For the record, 82% efficiency, and that probably just reflects that he's not taking risky options as much as he used to. Zelma Zam says James Aish is a massively underrated player. I probably agree with this in the sense that I think a lot of people outside of of WA probably forgot James Ace. It's like not only still at Fremantle, but playing decent footy. So as far as I can tell, he's playing mostly you know, wing and half back, I think this year. And that is a role that is getting increasingly lower possession counts. In particular, the wing spot, you know, because they say that like a lot of wings in these days just do a lot of running on the outside and they don't get used as such. But he's still, you know, winning 22 possessions a game. His efficiency is good at 77%. His meters gained is 403, which is very healthy. So yeah, he's still a good player. By the way, this True Footy video is brought to you in a paid partnership with BetterHelp. Now, what is BetterHelp? Essentially, it is a platform that connects you with credentialed therapists who are trained to listen and give helpful, unbiased advice. 
If you're somebody that has been considering starting therapy, I can understand if there's a few things about it that might make you feel a little bit uneasy. Specifically, sometimes the face-to-face -face interaction component of it can seem a little bit intimidating. And also you wanna make sure that you get the right therapist for you. Sometimes the right therapist for you is not in your area. And this is why BetterHelp's good because it matches you with these therapists. And then you can schedule those therapy sessions at a time that is convenient for you over phone call, video chat, or even messaging if that is what's convenient for you. To get started in the process, click the link in the description below or in the pinned comment. It basically takes to a survey, you fill that out, it helps them assess your specific needs. And in most cases, you'll be matched with a therapist within 48 hours. So if you do get matched with a therapist and you're feeling like this isn't quite the right fit for you, you can switch to another one at no additional cost. So if you think you might be someone who could benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in the description below or go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy. Now, clicking that link does help support the channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. So you can be matched with a therapist who can listen and help you. The Blues says the hate that certain commentators get in brackets BT or Kelly Underwood will breathe and they'll get smashed online. Yeah, is it underrated or overrated? I absolutely agree. I have to agree with. I, I can't help but cringe when I just see all these like Kelly Underwood like TikToks and Insta reels about something else she's messed up in a game. Like, don't get me wrong, she makes some bad mistakes sometimes, but okay, so like for instance, saying 2004 instead of 2014, I don't think it's worth putting that on an Insta reel for everyone to laugh at. That being said, I did see a horrendous one this week and I, I it was so bad that I have to assume she did it on purpose, but she referred to Charlie Combin and Greenwood as Comden and Greenbird. Like, you've got to be kidding me. When you've already got a re reputation for making mistakes, like that is so bad that it had to have been deliberate. In which case, I kind of think that's funny. But either way, I do agree that the only, uh, Underwood hate is not great. The BT, I think, has his fans. Um, I don't particularly like his commentary style. I haven't seen the hate to the same extent, other than the fact that people kind of, you know, make him a bit of a punchline. And to be honest, I kind of get that. <laughs> Couple more player suggestions. Mikey Magic says Josh Weddle is underrated. I would agree. Yes, I would agree. I think, um, you know, outside of Hawthorne, I don't know how many people are aware that he might be one of their best young prospects. Like he's probably, you know, in my mind, shaping up to be, you know, having a higher potential than say, you know, Josh Ward and potentially Cam McKenzie. It is so early, but with his athletic profile and, um, and his versatility, I, I could see Josh Weddle becoming a very good player. Luke99 says Adam Trelaw is the most underrated player this season. I think he's gotten a little bit of recognition, maybe maybe not quite enough as what he deserves. I have seen some discussion around his disposal efficiency. So I decided to have a look at his season in terms of stats. So he's ranked second in the league for disposals, but also fourth in the league for effective disposal. So yes, he is eighth in the league for turnovers, and that is probably what sticks out in people's minds. His ball use can be erratic, but he's still fourth in the league for effective disposal. So he's doing a lot of good. Um, and then one thing I do actually like about his game, he is mostly outside. It's like one in every three possessions he has are contested, the other two are uncontested. So he's undoubtedly more of an outside leaning midfielder. He's still winning his six clearances a game, and he's laying five tackles. So it's a pretty well-rounded game. He's just missing targets sometimes. We've got a few on Port Adelaide now, and I've done a little bit of a stats deep dive on this one. So Charles Atkinson says, as a Brisbane fan, Port Adelaide's backline specifically is underrated. Whilst Port are underrated as a top team, their halfback is one of the best in football and not talked about at all. Houston and Farrell, some of the best kicks in the comp. Alir Alir is still reliable. Lockie Jones is a gun. Radagalia, Burton, and McKenty or McEntee are all solid pieces, and Bergman is good. Port would win so many more games if they had a consistent forward line. And then we also have Ben Akers saying, Port may kill me. We play well, but lack forward options. Charlie's old. My underrated opinion is that Port's forward line needs some help. So to unpack all that, there's a suggestion that Port Adelaide's half back line is good and their back line is underrated and they've got a problem in the forward line. And I would agree with this. Everything you said in the first paragraph there, Charles, is bang on. They've got some really good individuals there, and I think the mix that they've you know transplanted in a couple of key backs, I think it's working quite well. And Bergman in particular, I think is maybe not underrated. I think people know how good he is. Maybe Kane Farrell is quite underrated. He is a great kick and has a knack for bombing long-range goals. But their forward line is interesting. So I looked through some stats. They are the number one team comfortably for inside 50 differential. So getting more inside 50s than their opponent. That is actually probably more a reflection of the midfield, right? Because it implies that they're not conceding inside 50s. So that's midfield pressure. That's actually not a backline stat. That's a midfield stat or at least a full ground defensive stat. Um, and the ability to generate inside 50s also comes from their midfield and a little bit of their back line. So, but either way, they're getting the ball inside 50, you know, much more than their opponent. They're comfortably number one 
in the league for shots on goal differential. So the difference between them and their opponent for generating shots on goal, number one in the league. They're also number one in the league for behind differential, comfortably, scoring way more behinds than their opponent. They're the highest expected score differential team in the comp. So what does that mean? It's, the, it's that if you looked at the expected score of each game, add it all up, Port Adelaide over the course of the season, have the number one differential in the league. There's also an interesting stat here. The average expected score per shot at goal, and this will reflect the average difficulty of shots taken. So every stat I've indicated up to this point has meant they're getting the ball inside 50, they're getting shots at goal, they're kicking a shitload of behinds, and they should be scoring a lot higher than they actually are. This stat, the average expected score per shot at goal, reflects how hard their shots at goal are. They're ranked 16th. In other words, on average, they are getting the third easiest shots at goal. So if that all doesn't map out how their forward line, at least their forward line efficiency is their biggest weakness right now, I don't know what will. I hope that all made sense. But to diagnose some of the issues here, I mean, Sam Pelpepper is an underrated player. Um, he kicked 31 goals last year. He's only played three games this year now out with an ACL. That's one. But in general, I've been talking in the preseason about Port Adelaide's forward line transition. A couple of older guys on the way out, in particular, Charlie Dixon, a couple of new guys coming in, Georgiatis coming off an ACL. And look, Looking at the, the stats breakdown of their forward line, no one is averaging more than two goals a game. Rioli is their leading goal kicker. He's only kicked 14 goals from nine games. Charlie Dixon's in second. Burn Jones is in third in that sort of new role in the forward line there. Todd Marshall's only kicked 11 goals from nine games. He's fourth. And Georgiatis has only played six games. Is still in the top five. So it just reflects that these guys not kicking goals. So... There you go. That's me vomiting heaps of stats as to Port Adelaide's forward line is underperforming. We've got a bunch on Essendon here. Firstly on Nick Martin. He's underrated due to his possession winning and using ability of running off halfback. I'm not too sure if he's underrated anymore. Um, I think the... It depends where you look. Like, if you go to the real mainstream stuff, does he get talked about? Maybe not. Um, I lo watch a lot of SEN. I feel like he gets a good rap there. Uh, but in terms of his improvement this year, he's plus nine in possessions, six rebound 50s a game. His meters gained have gone up by 250, six intercepts, six rebound 50s. Yeah, that's kind of largely due to the fact that he's now in a half back role. So naturally, these stats should go up. But either way, he's still having a massive impact. We've got a couple on Sam Durham. Thomas Cameron says, Sam Durham will be one of the best mids in the comp in a few years, and he's very underrated. And Judd Orchard says, Sam Durham is massive in Essendon's midfield. Again, another case alongside Nick Martin, where his improvement has driven Essendon's, well, partially their improvement as well. In the last five weeks, he's getting a lot more time at the center bounce. Uh, look at the stats. It's mostly in the last five weeks where he's getting increased inside time. He's doubled his contested possessions this year. He's also getting a little bit more outside ball. He's winning four clearances a game, which is up from one last year. Four inside 50s a game, which is up from 1.4 last year. Four and a half tackles a game, which is up from two last year. And he's also significantly up in score involvements and meters gained. So again, making a strong case for being one of the most improved players in the league. Tiger Storm says Sam Draper is overrated. I kind of agree with this a little bit, a little bit. So why do I think he's overrated? I, I think for the profile that he has and the suggestion that he is a very important player at Essendon, I think that is overblown. It's been a while since he's averaged a goal a game for a guy that now plays sort of as a forward alongside Goldstein. Um, but even before Goldstein got there, there was a decline in his output and he's now averaging less than 10 disposals and less than 15 hitouts a game. Bearing in mind, I am acknowledging Goldstein is now in the team. So it's actually hard to make the case that Sam Draper is a particularly high level Ruckman at all. Whereas I feel like, and that's the whole point of this video, the perception out there is that he is quite good. However, important caveat, I do think he's shown pretty good promising signs. He is not even 26 yet. So when we're assessing Ruckman, yeah, he's not necessarily a particularly accomplished Ruck or even a second Ruck, you know, third forward or whatever his role is, fourth forward probably. Yeah, he's not setting the world on fire and statistically hasn't really broken out yet. But the fact that he's not even 26, like Rucks do mature later. And I still think there's a good chance with his athletic profile, he's 205 centimeters. He's able to hit the scoreboard generally when he's forward. He hasn't done it consistently. I think he will be a good player. PMAFL says, the Essendon Edge. I'm not going to lie to you. I had to actually double check what the Essendon Edge was. I have heard that term all year and I kind of just ignored it. I didn't really know what it meant. So basically, uh, apparently it's just about playing hard, you know, playing with that toughness. That's what the edge is. Um, is it overrated? Yeah, it probably is in the sense that it probably doesn't really correlate with their improvement. I think um, I think that's coming from, um, you know, a lot of the things I just discussed. Got a few Eagles ones. Official CJ Coast. Uh, YT he says Tim Kelly this year Ethan Golding says Harley Reid is underrated and then Dean Basil Basil forgive me Dean um, says Eagles waffle setup if you look at it as Tim Kelly this year 
I think he's been pretty decent, um, but there are some unfortunate stats. Like he's only averaging 22 touches a game and ranked 11th in turnovers. However, I don't think that reflects where some games I really feel like he's lifted his effort and intensity and at times when the team's needed him, he's risen. However, I'd say last year he was a lot better. He won our best and fairest comfortably and was still a very good player. He is still also a top 20 player for tacklers when you consider he is an offensive leaning midfielder. However, one thing I do think people get wrong about Tim Kelly is that they seem to think now he's on the other side of the country and is in the worst team ever, or at least that was true in 22 and 23. They assume that he's not a good player anymore, but I would argue that Tim Kelly has evolved a lot since he left Geelong. And my argument is that he was simply in a much better team at the Cats. And while he still played good footy, I think he was all Australian in 2019. Looking statistically, he improved on 2019 in this West Coast side in 2023. The difference is he's got no support around him and no profile, but he's winning a lot more of his own ball. I think he's come a long way. And I think if you took the modern day Tim Kelly and put him back into the Geelong 2019 team, he'd be an even better player. I don't agree that Harley Reid is underrated. Um, no, I did no. <laughs> I think everyone knows he's damn good and what he's doing as an 18 year old is fantastic, even if it's not gonna be every week. But I mean, he's raging favorite for the rising star. As for the Eagles waffle setup, um, you know, for those who don't support the Eagles or live in WA, I'll give it a brief rundown. The Eagles set up their own reserve side a number of years ago. And um, in contrast to Fremantle, Fremantle are aligned with Peel Thunder. Now the rules around West Coast are that they can top up their list around their established AFL listed players with amateurs basically maybe one or two like genuinely good players but there's a harsh restrictions on what west coast can do to recruit for their reserve side by contrast Fremantle, having mixed with peel like their mature players around their listed players are going to be much better i think that's important to clarify for anyone to understand you know why there's discussion around the eagles waffle setup because the team has been useless and didn't win a game last year last year i don't think it's a fair analysis because there were games where we had two cat b rookies playing for the waffle eagles and the rest were amateurs and they lost a game by like 190 points or something like of course i'm willing to show patience with it i'm willing to be patient with it and assume that if we get players over the course of the season playing consistently together and perhaps they relax the restrictions on us a little bit allow us to get one or two more decent players then the waffle setup can continue the thing is as well the only alternative really is aligning with an existing waffle team like the perth demons but nobody really no waffle team actually wants to do that peel was the only one that was willing other than east perth who then decided they didn't want to do it anymore detrol man says mac andrew underrated or overrated I, I think the only answer here is underrated um you know i don't really hear that much about him and that's what we're assessing right but you know he's having a fantastic season. I, I knew that, but I looked up his stats. He's equal third in the game for intercept per game. The only players ahead of him are Sam Taylor and Sam Collins, and he's equal with Harris Andrews. He's also a third year player, and he was a ruckman, 202 centimeters, now playing back. What he's actually doing is you know, very rare for a guy of that height. 17 and a half disposals a game, 344 meters gained and going at 77% in terms of his disposal efficiency. So he is having a fantastic year and a gun, absolutely underrated. Pickle Green Guy says the entire idea of a Darwin based team. Um, yeah, probably overrated. I think it's probably the first one that gets suggested. And I understand the logic behind it, make it a, a truly national game by having pretty much everywhere in Australia represented at that point. I have my doubts over whether Darwin's going to be able to retain players. I think that logistically, like no shot at the city of Darwin. And I've heard it is beautiful, but I think retaining players, you'd have to rely heavily on a the local infrastructure and getting a lot of local talent, which I realize there is a lot of local talent coming out of Darwin, but I think there's so much groundwork to do first. And also you consider the attendance of Gold Coast versus North Melbourne on the weekend was 7,000 people. Um, yeah, I, I think that one requires some, some serious work to be done first. RAG4877, Clary is an interesting one. Will he get back to 2021 levels? I think so, says RAG. Yeah, so he's averaging 25 disposals and four and a half clearances a game. Like his output's solid without being outstanding. Um, it's interesting looking at the Demons and their like midfield rotations. They've actually got a very even mix of on-ball rotations. Uh, you know, some clubs have like two or three midfielders who get a lot of the center bounces. It's a lot more even at Melbourne. So for context, he's actually had the same center bounce attendances uh, by percentage as Harley Reid at West Coast, who, you know, is a first year player, of course. So, and that number is 71%, which is probably below what like top line midfielders generally get. Like for contrast, like Nick Dacos, I think is averaging 88% over the last two weekends. Long winded way of saying he's actually not getting a lot of time 
actually on ball, um, you know, still above average for sure, but not as much as you'd think, and his numbers are reasonable. I think we have to be patient with Clayton Oliver and realize he's coming from a long way back. Ollie's on the ball says retro round for all teams. Um, yeah, I like the idea of retro round. The only thing is, I think if you did it as one singular round, you would have to put a lot of thought into it. The reason being is because you have to consider who's playing who and what jumpers can be worn because you have to consider clash jumpers in that case. So it would almost require a conference every year saying, okay, this is the fixture for retro round. Does it work? Can, you know, say it's West Coast versus Carlton. First one that comes to mind. If we were a retro jumper that was our old Navy home jumper, Carlton also wear Navy and their retro jumpers are almost always going to be navy so that's the sort of thing would be considered which is a weird way and of answering your question and i realize i'm a bit of an overthinker <laughs> but that's the first thing to pop into mind i think uh retro retro games would be good tiger walser says richmond's injury list in brackets hopefully you can pronounce my name right this time i'm joking i know it's tiger walker <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm hilarious. Um, yeah, I think I think most people are across it. You know, I think um, it is borderline ruining their season. It probably has actually somewhat ruined their season. I mean, this is just like what it is at the moment. Uh, bear in mind, I'm recording this before round ten. Um, we know Bolter. I think he's in the team now, right? But he's missed some footy this year. Taranto's out for three to four. Hopper two to three. Lynch four to six. Barely played this year. Jackson Ross six to eight. Morris Rioli eight to ten. Gibkiss is out for the year. Jack Graham's currently listed as one to two, but he's done three soft tissue injuries this year. And that's just the relatively high profile ones. You've also got Sam Banks, Trezise, Clark, Campbell, Fawcett, and Kalina on the injury list. And then you have two players for round 10 who were tests in Baker and Grimes. So I think it's a suggestion they're down to like 26 or 28 players. And that is getting to West Coast levels. Ollie's on the ball says Nick Dacos. I don't think he's overrated, to be honest. This brings back into the conversation overhyped versus overrated. Again, I think the best example for this as an Eagles fan was Nick Natanui, where the hype was overblown. But then if you ask people, you know, where does Nick Nat sit in the competition? Most would say, oh, yeah, you know, sometimes he's the best ruck in the game on form. And then maybe he's third or fourth after that. Like the actual rating of the player is kind of pragmatic, but they get really excited over the highlights and the hype. And the fact that he's a Collingwood player as well does help in terms of the media narrative. But I don't think he's overrated. I don't think anyone's saying he's the best player in the game. Uh, mind you, in the last fortnight, he's been pretty pretty unreal and pretty close to that. But there's no real doubt about his midfield game now. He's played the last fortnight um, as the most centre bounces for Collingwood. He's fourth in the league for disposals, ninth in metres gained, fifth for inside 50s, five and a half clearances, and his ball use and his running and his ability to get from contest to contest sets him apart. So no, I think, I think he is... Definitely one of the best in the game. He's certainly not the best, but he's in his third year and he, he probably will end up the best player. Daniel Singh says, Jamie Elliott is so overrated. He gets about one good mark every 10 and then other than that, he's a sitting duck. Uh, yeah, I think that's harsh. I'm not sure who you go for, Daniel, if you're a Pies supporter or not. Um, I think he's been pretty consistent without being a genuine A-grade star. In the last few years, he kicked 39 from 24, 28 from 19, 25 from 13. You know, a couple of goals a game is very rock solid for a smaller medium forward type. He gets his three or four marks a game, three tackles. I think, again, it, it comes down to the fact that he's present in big moments. Like, he kicked a number of winning goals over the years and, you know, spectacular mark. He, he generates a lot of highlights. But again, I don't know if people say, you know, he's the best in the game at what he does. I think there's clearly better players. So I don't know if he's overrated, but it's just the fact that you associate him with spectacular big moments. That's why people talk about him a lot. Hash Burl says... Shepherds and blocks are underrated. Not sure if there is a stat on this, but it seems more and more that players are electing to be the next handball receive rather than opening up space. Yeah, I've heard this discussed before and I, I don't really know why that is the case. I assume it's coached, but it's kind of funny because I feel like certainly playing junior footy, that was a cardinal sin if you did anything like that. So I agree with you. Um, you know, I don't know the answer why. And finally, everything Essendon says, vodka cruises. Yeah. They, they, they're fantastic. Unfortunately, a lot of sugar in them. So if you're tracking your calories like I like to, it's also not great for hangovers to have lots of sugary drinks, but I love a girly drink. You know, I'll, I'll, when I'm on holiday and even when I'm not sometimes, I'll get the most pink and colorful um, cocktail. And I am the manliest man I know. So anyway, thank you guys. That's, uh, it's been a fun episode of AFL Underrated Overrated. The next one I'll probably do is a Would You Rather. I think we, we're due for that. That'll probably come next month. But uh, for now, I appreciate your input. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you like the content. And I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.